we have four panelists uh, from four different laboratories. Uh, these are all visionaries in their own right. Uh, we're going to let them talk a bit about uh, what the HPC world might look like in 2020. It always makes me think of C Lab 2020. Um, and then there's that parody, 2021. This will be much more entertaining than that. I'm, I'm assured that, that these are four of the most entertaining people that you'd ever want to hear talk about HPC in 2020. Um, presenting Al Geist from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Wake up, Al. Uh, Rob Ross uh, from Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, Lee Ward from Sandia. And Terry Quinn from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. <laughs> I mean, you know, these guys are duds, you know. <laughs> uh, you guys were doing your best. I know. Um, I guess we'll start. Each of them is going to present some slides. Uh, I mean, maybe 200 slides apiece. And if there's any time left over, uh, we'll have a panel discussion. Uh, with that, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Al Geist. Thank you, Steve. I didn't know I was going to be lead off batter here, but, um, but at least I knew how to follow directions. So we got an email uh, when we were they were first starting to form this panel and they said you only get three slides and uh, and we've got a number of questions that we want to ask uh, you to answer and then this went on the email went on for a couple of pages like 30 questions they wanted to answer but you only get three slides so uh, so I started paring that down um, and one of the, the first things they wanted us to address was kind of what our predictions were for systems in 2020 it turns out that you know, as it, one of my roles at uh, at Oak Ridge is a chief technology officer, so I'm always looking out. You know, what is what are the systems that we're going to be getting in the future? But I'm also been, as many of the people on this panel are, also entangled in this whole Department of Energy exascale plan too. So we're also looking at these issues. And so, um, so what I put down in my first slide here for predictions is that you know, I don't really have to predict what's going to be at say Oak Ridge National Laboratory in a 2020 time frame. Uh, I've been making up those plans for some time and our latest system which is Titan was put in place in 2012 and these systems have about a four or five year lifetime. That's just the way they work out and we're replacing them in a very steady um, cadence in that respect and so in the, about the 2017 time frame is when Titan will be replaced and it won't that machine will not be replaced until probably about 2022 so in the 2020 time frame that we're looking at it's really a system that we're working on trying to procure right now it's a system that we call LCF4 because we're not real creative when it comes to names we usually wait till the systems already come in have some sort of lottery people throw out a bunch of names and then Buddy Bland our, divi our director director picks a name that probably none of us uh, suggested. Um, but for now, there's also another name that's up there, This what I call the Coral System, and that's, you heard a little bit about it in a, in a presentation by Brad um, this, this afternoon already. Um, there was a uh, request for proposals that went out, and so in that request for proposals, we were basically defining what are the parameters for a system that we'd be looking at in this uh, 2017 that would last from 2017 to 2022. So I went back into that, you know, what we were asking for to give you some feeling for what are some of the parameters around this kind of system, what are the features we're looking for, and not not all the features, but really the ones that deal with the storage system. Uh, that deal with uh, features like burst buffers that are certainly going to be relevant to the folks in this this particular room. And so one of the things that we asked that that machine have in it or would be in VRAM. And we weren't specific about where it appears, but just that it should have some persistent memory uh, in the architecture. We said that that system ought to have a burst buffer in it. 
And again, we were not uh, specific about how that was architected into the system. We didn't really care, don't really know exactly what we would want. We'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, my next slide. Um, but then there were some other aspects where you'd say, well, in the 2020 time frame, are we really going to be using POSIX, for example? Well, one of the things that we required in this system is that it at least have a POSIX interface. Um, as Brad aptly pointed out in his talk just about an hour ago, is that the file system bandwidth is something this group might be really interested in, but in fact it's being totally driven by this requirement of checkpointing and not really by, you know, what do the, what do the science apps need uh, to write out I.O. What it's being driven by is the fact that well, you've got some memory in the system and you just want to be able to checkpoint it in six minutes turns out to be kind of a dominant factor in that requirement. Um, and then we, you know, wax poetic about how the file system ought to be able to handle a trillion files, a trillion directories. Um, the files, although not all trillion files, could be a terabyte apiece, but it ought to be able to be able to handle, you know, a file that was as big as a, as a terabyte. So. Uh, that kind of gives you a feeling for the robustness of the file system that we would like to see in this particular system. Um, in regards to integrity, we, you know, we actually asked for certain kinds of requirements in terms of, uh, you know, silent corruption that might occur in a large amount of memory. And then at the bottom is sort of in that where it says OLCF4, kind of gives you that rough numbers are very similar to the, exactly the same ones that Brad had found in the RFP as well. The RFP is, is, a, is a public document at this point. Um, you know, a machine, we were asking for a machine that's a, you know, at least 100 petaflops, uh, four petabytes of memory, about 120 petabytes of storage is kind of a, a situation. So the first question we had was what is your prediction for the system? So this kind of gives you a feeling for the kind of features that we're looking for for a system that would exist in 2020. And then we were asked, well, where is the storage going to reside in this system? And that's where when we started to uh, to just look at some of these uh, information we've been gathering for this exascale plan is that as far as I can tell is, you know, 2020 architectures just have storage everywhere. And it's, uh, it's scary in some sense because, you know, who, where is all that software is, you know, is uh, the file system, is Lustre, how close does it go up to the, to the nodes and how far out? Uh, Eric gave a picture where you had burst buffer, a row of racks that are like a burst buffer and then a bunch of rows that are disks. It's a very traditional type of, of setup. Here, I don't know if this thing actually has a laser. Let me point it at my face and see. Um, no, it doesn't. That's fine. Um, so I've got a, a couple of sort of extreme cases here and, and Eric in his exascale talk um, kind of pointed out both of them. His picture was really sort of the extreme case on this side where the file system was totally external to all of the compute nodes. The compute nodes are this big block he's got over on one side and then he's got his green uh, racks of disks and, and burst buffers. And uh, so there's this extreme case where the file system is totally separate. And then the other extreme case he mentioned but didn't actually have a picture of which is you know, where the computer now is your file system. There isn't a big, uh, you know, a bunch of disks or anything that, in fact, all of the storage is just the, that's what the, the file system is, is your computer. You don't even think about it as being flops. You, flops are so free, it's all about data movement and storage. So those are sort of the extremes, and this line in the middle is sort of like to represent, you know, a slider that at each one of these different levels of creating these kinds of machines, we have burst buffers, and you can have burst buffers out in the I.O. nodes, which is what Eric's picture showed, or you can have burst buffers in the, in the compute nodes themselves. And so you have the storage now is potentially reaching all the way to every one of the compute nodes in the system. Similarly, in VRAM, which you know, we had asked for in the curl system, you know, where does that reside? Well, it might, might reside out in those I.O. nodes, but might actually be used like memory even out there, or it could be on, you know, every one of the compute nodes, or it could be in both. So as the slider is kind of in the middle here, it's kind of saying, well, you could get a machine that's got every one of these options um, in it at the same time. 
And then um, our third question was really about concerns. And given uh, the architectures we see and the storage systems and where they might reside, what are our concerns around HPC and uh, architecture and storage? And of course, Luster is coming to the rescue in this picture uh, for everyone. Um, but the thing that kind of scares me is that we might be architecting these uh, big computing systems for, say, the Oak Ridge you know, Leadership Computing Facility for the class of problems that we see today all the time. So very big science, floating point, dominant sort of applications, and they, yeah, they might write out big files. But we see going down uh, into the future, it's kind of this big data science problems that might completely change the way um, both the file system and the file system structures, the case um, use cases that Lustre has been developed for, moving big blocks of data, or, um, or where storage resides, could really change dramatically in terms of what kind of systems we want to have. So the kinds of concerns I have resolve around whether these architectures and the software the file system software that we are creating is really going to handle some of these cases. So one of them is uh, ones where we take our big computers and we couple them to the experimental facilities that exist around the country. But in particular at Oak Ridge, an example is the Splatian Neutron Source. It's a large neutron accelerator that we have there. It generates a lot of data. And what they would like to do, it's a pulsed uh, neutron source that pulses at 60 hertz. So they would actually like to be able to do calculations in between the pulses to understand how to steer that experiment. Uh, and so there are some interesting new features about you know being able to get data off of experimental facilities, pouring them into a computer, and being able to turn that information back around. That feedback loop could revolutionize the way we do discovery, but at the same time, it's not really the way we've used Luster in the past or, or even the way we've used our big computers. So there's some really interesting uh, issues in terms of concerns that, you know, it may be, may, we may not be designing our architectures to best fit that. The second is really trying to look at uh, analysis of you know, big data. So this is where we get things like satellite data. We're looking for a Malaysian plane, for example. Um, we're not, but there are some people in the world that actually are using their supercomputers to do exactly that from satellite data. Um, getting a lot of information from sensors, which we are doing for uh, weather, and experimental data, and trying to combine that and using the supercomputer to do the analysis as opposed to using Amazon.com or Hadoop sort of big data analysis uh, calculations. And so the, again, the use case for the way we've used these big computers is very different from that. So the worry is that uh, again, both the architecture as well as the, the storage software may not be well designed for it. The third one, from, from my standpoint, tends to be even scarier because I don't have to do the coding for the first two, but I have to worry about things like the policies and the security, and that is the, the uh, desire that seems to be coming down the pike that if we're going to be doing this type of large data exploration or our machines are generating huge amounts of data like the big uh, telescopes that we ought to be able to um, curate that data, do provenance on it, and make it available to researchers all over the world. In the past, the way we run these big computers is they run their simulations our policy is we give them two weeks to get their data off our file system and then it's cleared out so that we can you know, make other runs. So there's a, a buffer of storage that we have to hold for people for a period of time that's fairly short and then it's cleared out and so we, we're churning through our data structures all the time in a very you know, clean way. If we have to keep saving all of everyone's data and making it available not to them who we've cleared for being able to use our computers uh, but being able to be 
accessed by you know whoever wants it around the world that could be a real issue for us in terms of how the file systems are structured how we uh, how we work with the different policies in terms of being able to keep the data for a long period of time. Um, when do you consider it to be so old that uh, probably no one will ever want it again? Um, those sorts of issues. So with that, I'm going to um, leave the dragon and his puppet to, uh, to let Lester save the day and we'll move on to Rob. <laughs> I didn't know they'd let a PBFS guy in here, so um, anyway, no harm so far. Um, so um, I was asked to talk about future HPC systems. There won't be any PBFS in future HPC systems. Um, and some uh, implications on storage software. Um, and so I thought I'd start with hardware. Uh, it turns out that without any coordination, Al and I have covered um, similar ground. And so I'll try to extract some different meaning from some of these slides. So this slide. Um, is a slide that we, we put together um, back in 2010. It was a big community effort, and the thing you can learn from this slide is that you should not trust our predictions of our systems past the ones we're about to buy. Okay? All right, so next slide. Uh, <laughs> so Al, Al covered that space, um, I think, quite well. Um, there are some predictions on that slide. If you want to look at them, I'm sure you can have a look at them, but um, yeah, I wouldn't trust them too far. Um, one thing that uh, we were asked to, to sort of take a stance on is whether there'll be disks or not. I think it's pretty obvious there'll be disks. Um, this is some uh, sort of an analysis that was done by a colleague of ours, uh, Brent Welsh, who's now at Google. And uh, what he looked at was, okay, well, how much um, NVRAM is really being built on a yearly basis? And uh, the answer is about uh, one and a half exabytes of, of uh, NVRAM. Um, so if you believe these numbers back here, um, we were going to, we would have to buy, you know, somewhere around 50 to 75 percent of the annual you know, total of, S, of SD built in a year. That's not going to happen, right? That would just, I don't, I don't have to be an economist to know that that isn't going to happen. So uh, we'll have to have disks. Um, and, and so then that leads to the next question of where might we put this NVRAM in a system? Where might we put um, disks in the system? And I don't think we're going to put disks anywhere except on sort of the periphery of the system. It doesn't make any sense from a packaging perspective. And that's probably not interesting to talk about past that, so we won't. Um, there are three interesting places where we might put non-volatile. Um, one is out in the storage nodes. That's easy. You don't have to worry about the user screwing around with it um, because you own it as the system software, right? And, and in some ways, that's great. Um, it makes it uh, a lot uh, more deterministic with respect to your, you know, the, the storage system's use, our use as file system people's use. Um, and basically, is sort of a PFS accelerator out there and we've heard some ways that that can be used, right? Um, another place you could put it is in these I.O. nodes that we've talked about. So these nodes that sort of sit between the big box. This is a blue box, but um, it's not entirely clear who's going to have the blue boxes and who's going to have the other color boxes in the next generation. So um, anyway, um, so you have these. I think that there is a laser. There is, but it's anemic. OK. Um, you have these I.O. forwarding nodes, and you can put in VRAM in those. And the end result is, is what we think of as this burst buffer uh, concept today, where you have a staging capability for moving data um, from the system to the periphery quickly and then trickling data off, moving data into uh, a region ad adjacent to the system, thank you, and, um, and then pulling it in quickly, right? And that gives you some capabilities that are quite useful. You can also imagine um, putting data in this that you don't intend actually to move it back out again, right? So you, uh, this notion of checkpointing we've talked about so much, where well, you can push a checkpoint into this and then maybe you don't push all the checkpoints out to storage. That's entirely reasonable based on the fault characteristics. And Eric was right earlier that there aren't that many of those nodes. The chances of them failing were much lower. Maybe that's a good bet, right? Um, the last place you might put some non-volatile 
is in the compute nodes themselves. And a, a great thing about that is that then your system becomes much less deterministic. And uh, if you're interested in getting work done efficiently, then that's exactly the opposite of what you want. Um, and so that makes for interesting research challenges. And since I'm a researcher, I'm, I'm highly in favor of this because <laughs> chances are we'll be working on this for a decade before we get it right. Um, which is okay because if we don't do this in 2020, then we might have it figured out by 2024. Uh, no, but seriously, there, there are real, really good use, reasons for this. Um, application teams are very interested in having a, an augmented memory um, and, and taking advantage of this as a, as a way of working on problems they couldn't work on otherwise. Um, our, our friends at Livermore and, and our colleagues at, at Argonne also have uh, shown techniques for um, storing uh, resilient data, effectively storing checkpoints in the system by shuffling data around between nodes, and this would be a way to do that at very high bandwidth. Um, and so, so there are some, some nice um, possibilities with this approach, but that this, this issue of noise is a serious one and one that um, we'll be working on for some time, I expect. So the second topic I wanted to speak to is, is about software and integration. And I just wanted to reflect for a moment on uh, a, a picture from a, a, a book by Ken Berman. Um, and this is really about internet services and the notion that we have these uh, very uh, strongly resilient, often tightly coupled infrastructure services that sit way down deep in the internet where we never interact with them. And then sort of subsequently, perhaps less reliable, less tightly coupled services that work their way out to uh, the endpoints that we are using right now because my talk's not that interesting. And so you've got a web client. Um, and we haven't done a good job of adopting this sort of model in HPC systems. Um, there have been experiments where we, we tried this notion of uh, very loosely connected clients, and in fact, Eric sort of mentioned this notion of getting away from uh, locking being held on clients and things like that earlier today, but largely we are still in this mode where we tie our clients into our systems in a way that when they fail, we have problems at the system level. And so when we think about um, the integration and, and uh, challenges on these systems and scale on these systems we, and reliability on these systems, this notion of sort of stateless things on the periphery and in our clients makes a lot of sense. And then uh, the other point I wanted to make on this topic is that uh, the file system, for, for a long time we got away with sort of just presenting an API and, and calling it done and not worrying too much about the rest of the system. But reality is, especially at these very large scales, we're, we're often working with um, fairly eccentric networks, um, fairly bleeding edge architectures and systems, and having to pull a, a system like a parallel file system, like Lustre, into that environment means um, understanding the components that we're going to be operating with and, and having a good mechanism for integrating with those components. And so uh, there's a couple of ways in which that's true. On the left, I'm showing you know, the fact that basically at this point, many of our applications don't directly interact with the file system, but rather interact with it via some library like uh, HDF uh, or maybe parallel net CDF or Adios. Um, and that, in fact, there's a number of layers that sit between the file system and even those layers, uh, particularly in these systems where IO forwarding occurs. And so doing a good job of, of understanding how those layers are going to work together to really streamline access is as important as making sure that, for example, the way we manage the disk on a particular OSS is important. Um, the second example is this, just this notion that there's a whole bunch of different networks um, and uh, hoops that data has to jump through getting from a compute node out to the storage system. And um, and again, sort of making sure that we understand um, what the properties are of those networks and making sure that we then cater to those. And in some cases, that can mean some fairly um, significant changes to how we uh, manage the networking uh, in those components of our software systems. And then finally, there's some other services that I didn't mention here, but um, you know, in some sense, the PFS is the best understood global or, or distributed service in an HPC system. It's certainly the hardest one to get right so far. But um, 
more and more people are, are taking uh, the RAS service seriously as a, as a first class service in these systems and understanding how to deal with um, capturing and containing faults from particular compute nodes and other hardware. And as that system matures as a peer, we're going to have to understand as, as file system developers how we interface with that and take advantage of capabilities that that service may have that allow us to understand the system better than we do today. Um, and so there's an opportunity there, but also sort of a play well with others there. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, and, and I'll mention big data. Um, it's happening. It, this is data from uh, mid-2011, actually. And uh, the, the graph is generated from uh, this data from this um, software project that uh, my team works on called Darshan, which characterizes data on our uh, leadership systems. And what we're looking at uh, is a one-month uh, snapshot of, of data accessed, reads and writes, um, back in 2011, and the blue bars are reads, and this is only the simulation system. This is not the analysis system or the login nodes or any of that stuff that you would think of as the places where reads happen. And what you can see, and we, we were able to map this back to applications. Um, over here, uh, this was a concrete data analysis for a concrete application. Um, seismograph, so earthquake and um, a fluid mix, the supernova data analysis. Um, so we're already using these machines for, um, for data analysis, and we're already doing heavy reads for certain applications. Now, this doesn't happen every month. It's pretty interesting, actually, and that's a, there's a paper about that. And from a month-to-month -month basis, depending on who the big apps are running that month, you know, who's got their paper that's due, or um, who's got their code up and ready for their hero runs, um, things shift, um, but this is a trend that we're seeing more and more of and, and we expect to see more of. And so even as we try to keep the checkpoints moving, um, we have to understand how to cater to this read heavy workload as well. And I think the NVRAM, you know, is going to fit into that, but we still have to figure out the right way. Thank you. We're deadlocked. We're, we're keeping your mic turned on. I was just going to introduce Lee, you know, as a stone. So, <laughs> Lee Ward, San Diego. That's me. Well, the big kill here's too. So, which way goes forward? That ain't it. You're up. I'm up? What do you mean I'm up? Which way's forward? This one? Yep. You're holding upside down. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Was on icon for that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the story of my life. You're holding it upside down. <laughs> so the first thing we were asked to do was predict, predict what the architectures look like. And I think along with everybody else, I predict the current vector extends. Um, I, there's a couple of interesting things on this slide. The, the second bullet says hybrids. And I hope I'm wrong about this. Um, they keep talking about integrating the GPUs into the, the cores effectively, but the GPU guys stay so far ahead of the CPUs that we may keep using coprocessors. There is an echo up here, I remember. Um, uh, more cores per node, a lot more cores. When it gets large enough, the coherency mechanisms within the chips fall apart. And so they're talking about things like uh, being able to establish subdomains of memory coherency. That could be interesting. That could be something that if they actually do it, we could leverage in some way. And then I'll talk about that a little bit later. But other than that, I think more memory. Um, I think more memory per core. The users are complaining about the memory per core now. And, and we'll get non-volatile memory. Everybody else has predicted that. Nothing special. Oh, use this, not that. OK. So um, non-volatile memory on node is an interesting concept. Um, Rob went through the options. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pick one. Um, 
One I think that's interesting and worth a lot of exploration, and I hope actually can make an appearance in the time frame we're discussing. So, I mean, the, the first way to look at it is the obvious way we've been looking at things, which is, you know, it's a nice low latency, high bandwidth device that we could maybe even say page on. Right? We can do out of core. Rob mentioned people have been looking at mechanisms for doing things using these, but as devices, and that's too traditional. And I'm, I'm not very enamored of traditional. So, um, you know, burst buffers, that's the big rage right now. You could bring your burst buffer on node. No, that's, that's just wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Um, burst buffers are great as intermediates in the shipping layer, but local to the node in a persistent memory, I'm, I'm, I don't think so. So it's memory. That's what we're talking about here. Non-volatile memory is at its heart memory. So flash is a block device, effectively. But other techni technologies are not. They're by granular. They don't mind. They don't have right you know, problems where they, they sort of run out of oomph and quit taking your data. Um, latencies along the lines of DRAM or even faster, you know, towards SRAM. Um, so it's, it, we, we put it on the memory bus. That's where it goes. It goes on the memory bus, first class citizen. Um, if it has to be flash, we front it with DRAM and super caps to make, to make it fast but persistent. Um, and without the right problems. Um, and we really don't want to use it as a cycle granular thing, at least not in its persistent state. Um, at, at my lab, we tend to do a lot of um, very strongly coupled simulations and um, having a node die with persistent memory in the middle of a loop or something isn't that useful. We need to restart it at a different point. So all the things have to come together and synchronize at the same time. Or snapshot, really. I mean, for if you're talking about a file system kind of thing. Um, but then uh, nodes die. So we really need a way to get at these non-volatile dims, which is what I'm, I'm talking about up here, I think. Um, even when the node dies. So there should be a vampire processor that can power the DIMMs either individually or all at once and use the NIC to transfer the data off, even if, you know, the CPU is smoking. So where does the storage live? There's no storage. It's memory. Um, it's persistent memory. Um, so that's what we talk about. So is it I.O. anymore? I don't know. I, I don't think so. It's a, it's a load store interface, right? We use the CPU move instruction to ship data around. We don't use open, close, read, write. We just don't use those things. Um, so there's a sub-bullet about, you know, it's just memory in the state that the name snapshot saved. And I, I think I discussed that pretty well and too early, sorry. <laughs> this is where I meant to do it. Um, these nodes are modified Harvard architecture nodes. They have separate address spaces. Uh, there, there's hardware caches on the separate spaces. We can add more. We can add a NUMA aware space, which gets interesting. It goes back to the, that point I said, please remember from the first slide, in that uh, we, we've got a very large address space now. And, and remember, 64K is enough, right? So even we got 64 bits now, so 64 bits is enough in 20 years. I hope there's jokes written about that. Um, anyway, so we can have a NUMA partitioned address space, take all this NVM, post it to everybody. Um, you know, this, this kind of architecture was explored, and not without difficulty at Los Alamos, um, with Blue Mountain, what what years was that? Eh, early 2000s. Yeah, but they got it to work. We know how to make this work. Our applications developers know how to partition and keep cores in local segments of memory and not exercise shipping memory across the, the interconnect too awful much. So everything is in place to do this. And what it winds up saying is there is no I.O. locally. It's all memory. We can have a persistent memory system like my iPhone. You know, I turn it on, 
Everything that the last time I turned it on is still there. I scroll, I just resume the app that's going. And we can do that both for, I think, steering um, and for reliability. So is there still spinning media? Yes, it's on the edge. It's part of an enterprise solution. And this machine is just another consumer of that. It doesn't have this checkpoint load anymore. Is that contentious enough? Do I get to get a go? Terry? This is the right side. Says, uh, yes, there's going to be disks, and, and Lee says yes, but we're not going to use them. <laughs> In the enterprise, though. Yeah. All right, so five years out is not really a very long time when you look at vendor roadmaps. You know, these things take a long time to, to percolate and they've been working on them. And if you're nosy, they'll tell you about them. So, so I think predicting things about architectures isn't, for HPC at least, isn't, isn't too hard, which is probably why you're seeing a lot of similarities. But let me just uh, talk to you about something from, that's important to uh, probably all of our codes, but particularly important for us that I can speak to. And that is the importance of, of memory per core and the importance of memory bandwidth per, per flop for our applications. And so we just, you know, if you just look at these are old systems here. I can't see it. So all of these are systems that have already been uh, installed and deinstalled. Cielo is still and Sequoia are still around. And if you look at the memory per core, which is gigabyte per core, um, and uh, the uh, B to F ratio, you'll see that we're, you know, we've been fairly consistent in trying to keep that up. And, um, and that's good. And you can see Sequoia is kind of challenging that right now, which makes Sequoia a challenge for our applications. Um, <clears throat> but then we asked uh, about, um, I can't remember, two years or two and a half years, maybe longer, we uh, put an RFI out for Exascale RFI and we asked vendors, you know, what are they going to deliver us without any kind of exascale funding, any kind of big investment from the government. And um, that's what's in red here. So that's what they told us. It's pretty bleak. So um, <clears throat> for our applications, we're worried about how you can get, you know, of course we don't have exascale funding, so, so this, is, this is where things are going. And, and I think that history is burying this out. A few years later, this is actually true. And what, in their whole, you know, you, people have talked about it here, but core density is increasing very dramatically. Memory size and bandwidth per core are decreasing very dramatically. And then, of course, we all know data movement is a huge power consumer. Uh, other people alluded to this. Hierarchical computing is going on now. We've got, you know, vector processors. You've got, you've got accelerators. You've got uh, SIMD units. It's also, you see that in the memory. We're seeing all sorts of interesting memory technologies. Um, I'll talk a little more about that. Um, and a lot of innovative technologies are out there too, but I don't think they're going to fundamentally change this problem for us. So what we're looking at is worried about how to, how to deal with performance and managing the data motion. So I think there's this convergent, other people alluded to, of memory and storage. You know, what a device can be used, depending on how you, how you present it to the user or the consumer of it, is it a storage device or a memory device? It's up to you. We just need those, we just need those kind of uh, interfaces. There's also a lot of innovative technology going on there. It's not just NVRAM. We've got, you know, uh, memory being moved to closer to the, uh, to the compute, right? We've got compute and memory, a little bit of compute being mixed with the memory. Um, you know, we, we don't seem to get both, oops. We don't seem to get both at the same time, though. We don't get, uh, we get fast, but really fast memory presented to our applications, but, but usually it's small capacity. We get slower but larger, and even slower but even larger. So we don't get what we want, which is really fast and really large at the same time. Um, so that presents a problem to us. The other thing is capacity. It's the total capacity of the machine. If you can't fit your problem on the machine, you've already lost the game. So, but memory costs a lot of money. Moving things, moving data costs a lot of money. So this is the problem. 
So I will, you know, I'm not, this is not a genius to say this, but NVRAM will be introduced somehow near, and this is to compensate not really for storage, but really for this, this, this memory per core and this, this total memory that the presented to the applications that I talked about. Um, and if it's in sufficient quantities, you know, we might be able to uh, eliminate the need for, you know, disk coupled right close to the system. Maybe, and I think uh, Lee talked about this, the bulk of I.O. is going to stay in the, maybe just stay in the compute, the compute system, right? We're just not going not to send it off. Um, and then where disk will come in is, is a cache to our, our tape archive. And um, I put rate there with question marks only because DOE has paid for rate. I think this is the third time. I'm, I'm assured that it's here now in HPSS, and uh, NCSA has used it for a year. So, so maybe I shouldn't have put the question mark there. But it's kind of like you know metadata performance and luster. We've paid for that three times too. So, um, but I hear it's going to happen. So that just maybe our site-wide file system is a big take archive with a disk disk cache in front. So what they ask is what our biggest worry is. This is the biggest worry. We're going to have all this hardware, this hierarchical hardware in here, you know, the storage system, the memory system, the compute system. We don't have software to deal with it right now. And, and, and we know this hardware is coming along. Something people, I, I, there are some other questions that alluded to, to things on this slide, so I went ahead and uh, looked at this. But how will our applications team compensate for this? You know, I told you they want this, you know, two gigabyte per core, this sort of a, uh, a fairly large and healthy uh, a byte for, per flop ratio, and which we're not going to get. But it's, history have told, told us that, uh, you know, just because they can see this performance crisis, they're not doing anything about it. It's, it has to actually be here before they're going to change their applications. So these kind of other sort of predictions I'm making is my prediction whether the pain threshold is going to be high enough in this time frame that they're actually going to do something. So I think they will have a POSIC interface, right? It's just not going to go away. They're not going to change, as unfortunate that is. And there will be increased uses of um, approaches to avoid saving and storing data. So these are some things a lot of people have uh, I have been toying with and some people seriously playing with, I think that's going to get greater adoption. Uh, and I think most applications are going to need to go to this end to M. It's just not going to work. Whether we have to help them do that or provide interfaces like the, um, the, uh, one of the earlier talks, uh, it's just going to have to happen because we're not going to solve the, the metadata problem for them. But I think today's lessons, as I say, will still apply. If you, t if you don't have to move the data, please don't. If you don't have to store the data, please don't. Check. Testing. Hello? Is this thing on? Hello? Uh, thank you, Terry. Thank you all. Um, so I, I'm going to pick on, on uh, Al and Lee. You said, well, you know, Lee says there'll be disks, but we're not going to use them. I mean, do you disagree with that? Well, I think uh, Terry has now given us the solution. We wondered about the curiosity that there would be disks, but then we wouldn't use them. And then Terry got up and said, yes, if you have data, just don't store it. <laughs> so you have storage. You just don't use it. Memo to self, you know. <laughs> I think what she said was we are going to build a, a, an archive system out of tapes instead of the disk system? Is that what we're getting to? Yeah, that's what she said. <laughs> we have an archive out of tape. We're yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where disk will be, though, to, to In, be as a cache. Mishmash. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, so we all agree. <laughs> well, in that case, I'm I'm out. Uh, I mean, I was here for you know just death-defying action, but you know. You guys are boring. No, well, <laughs> so let me ask a few questions. Just you, to throw, because there are some interesting things that we've talked about up here. So Lee was the one that really said, well, we should have, you know, all the, it, we don't need any stinking disks. We can just have all of the NVRAM sitting in the system. I think that's a very interesting Or topic. a file system. Yeah, or a file system. Um, Rob was saying, you know, that's a very interesting research topic, but there's this huge problem with uh, non-determinism in that issue. And so I think it might be interesting to have those two guys sort of talk a little bit about, you know, how do you solve the non-determinism issue or what is the non-determinism <laughs> issue? Lee and I have been talking about that for about two years now with no conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> 
the solution is not deterministic between the two of them. <laughs> NP hard. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but this, this group hasn't heard your two years of conversation. So, Could you yeah, summarize so, it in, say, three sentences? So, so a little background, and Lee can correct me. Um, we've been working to, uh, sort of collaboratively on this, this project to look at um, sort of future non-POSIX, non-file storage systems. And um, one of the issues that kind of keeps coming up is, is whose responsibility is it to um, work through conflicts effectively and, and to help figure out where the, the right, and by right I mean latest version of something is. And, um, and when we say who, what we really mean is, is it, the, is it the role of the storage system to always know the latest, greatest thing that someone stuck in this very large and complicated system? Or is it up to middleware or end users instead to use this storage system to track and, and, and uh, discover these things in some effective way, short of just searching the whole thing for, uh, for the, the item of interest? And um, I, I don't know what to say, except that we don't have, a, we don't have an answer to that question. We don't. Um, it's an open question. Rob is working on the, you know, index it. Um, localize it to a small subset of servers so that you have scalability. And I am working on the um, never couple the storage side, which means data gets to move freely. And that's when this, uh, where, where'd I put that, comes in. So um, I got up in front of DOE headquarters and asked a bunch of users if, if it was okay if I lost a little bit of their data. <laughs> they just, they didn't think that was funny. I, don't um, think they I did. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> they didn't think I was serious. They think Rob's got the good call, um, but uh, they'll find out. Yeah. I won't tell you which data, so it's cool. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> but I mean, really, this feeds into this issue, uh, and, and this is something that, that Eric and, and the Intel team with uh, the EMC guys have been sort of dealing with of, um, you know, delegation of responsibility in these complex uh, software stacks, and, and something that, that Terry mentioned, too, which is that really, the file system is just sort of one player in a pretty complicated system. And right now, we put a, a lot of um, responsibility on the file system, even though it doesn't really know a hell of a lot about what's going on. And, and a lot of what we've been debating and the, the fast forward team have been debating is sort of, well, maybe there's a better delegation of roles than that. Um, yeah. Maybe not. but. Injecting code in deep into the I.O. system and having it run it from pulling the file system up into the application piecewise and having it run that. Not all of it, but parts. It's too fluid, too unknown. Okay. So another thing is that by pulling in the NVRAM into the system, we do, in terms of fitting with what, what Terry was saying, it really gives us a huge advantage in the amount of memory per core, because if we look at the plots of that over the years, it's just been going down into the toilet. But now suddenly there's this opportunity for sort of memory per core to be much better. But but there's a there are two really big catches. One of them I didn't hear um, in the panelists today. One of the catches Terry mentioned, which is the performance is lower. You get the you get a much higher volume. Uh, near the compute, but it's going to be much slower than DRAM, and so exactly how to exploit that or how it couples with the storage is one issue, but the other is is where. MRAM is almost the speed of cache. Well, there was also this. I wanted when you were saying, "Oh, I've got uh, I've got memory that's persistent and faster than DRAM." I'm thinking, well, that's what I want. Where do we Where do we uh, sign up? And then I thought we buy it. I yeah, and then we can well, buy it. So. <laughs> Nobody said that part. <laughs> I thought you were going to say MTA. <laughs> but um, so there is the issue certainly with things like Flash, though, is where is, a, is certainly a serious consideration when we look at these big systems. And if we're putting, we, we, we solve the memory per core, but at the expense of, well, but the data, you know, may wear, your memory might wear out. And what do you deal with, how do you deal with that from a storage system? How do you deal with it when it's out there in a burst buffer and wearing out? I don't think we've really considered the, the issues there um, on these large systems. 
All right, so, so we've gathered you guys together. Uh, I, I know Al's got a question. You guys open to a question? Sure. Absolutely. I'm just checking. I'm trying to be polite. Hit it, Al. You say the ratio is going down. Who's to say that the architectures for the NVRAM have got to be associated with the cores? If you start opening up the address bus and start to have NVRAM as a part of the new architecture, take a look you know, at what you had with the earlier fast forward things that Eric was showing. What's to say that you couldn't have the, the lower side? If you, know, if you had the, the rightmost side was all the burst buffers, what's to say that you couldn't have the lower edge being a bunch of boxes that are all directly memory addressable as NVRAM appliances? Who says it's got to be on the core? The latencies Question. go wonky. Um, you can't get too far from the CPU chip or it stops looking like memory. So my dream goes south. Somebody else can address the rest of it. Uh, there, there, go ahead. There, there's both latency, latency issues too, right? I didn't talk about that, but, but um, too far away. there's bandwidth, there's latency, and there's capacity with it. So certain applications, that certainly might be a possibility if they can tolerate that kind of a latency. The kind of applications I'm talking about um, our applications, people would not be happy with that. The reason why we were talking about the, the long-term science satellite, the kind of technology. Yeah. All right, we're not going to throw, you know, we ought not to throw that away. So, I've got, I've got a question for Lee. Uh-oh. Um, I like the persistent, I mean, obviously I'm a fan of the persistent memory idea, but it has a big problem, which is schema variation. If I want to recompile my program and change my data structures, how is my persistent memory image going to cope? So the data segment is a linker issue, or at least this persistent data segment, right? Um, how do we deal with upgrading libraries today? To some extent, it can be done. Um, people are using on my nodes now Python loading, you know, hundreds of dynamically linked libraries. You know, version skew can be accounted for in some of these things. I can't hear you. He says he's going to map thousands of tiny regions. Well, so, I mean, uh, if you're recompiling, you're recompiling you know, one region, right? And and the symbols in there can be protected with version. If you'll keep the API the same, I can recompile and continue the darn thing. This was done, the foundations are here. This exact problem was solved in the 1960s on, you know, deck tens. They could have upgraded their libraries live while the code was running. All those people that did that are dead now. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> so I do believe in my complex we have this problem in a different way, and we seem to be solving it with, with our core mission, even. All those people are dead, but we continue on. <laughs> uh, it appears that uh, the programming models need to fundamentally change to make use of these architectures. For example, PGAS-like programming models. but. How will this change happen so quickly? I mean, this course existing for the last so many decades to re reliably make use of this kind of architectures. Uh, we really need to migrate all the uh, applications to use uh, new programming models. Uh, what are your thoughts? What are your comments? I'm getting this I, I actually couldn't hear that. Yeah, yeah me so neither. How, how the application forever. <laughs> <laughs> what, what the programming models for these new architectures that have persistent memory in them. Yeah. How do you? How do we get the application teams to change? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. To move uh, forward. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> we, so good, good question. They promised we could do this to them once. Remember? <laughs> they said once you can you can just upend our lives. Well, I want to take them at, at their word. You know, it's like here's your node. There is no I.O. system. <laughs> Here's your interface. Do what you wish. If you can get your legacy code to run on there, more power to you. <laughs> okay, it's not quite that bad. I'm not allowed to say things like that to my user. <laughs> but, but I mean, uh, in all seriousness, there, there have been uh, numerous PGAS-related efforts, um, you know, at least in, in, in the time that I'm aware of in, in my career and, and prior to that, that haven't gone as far as they could have. I mean, if you're... 
you're running NW Chem, I guess you're running pretty much a PGAS style, but there aren't that many codes that have picked that up and, and, and run with it, and the uh, explicit message passing still seems to be the way to get performance out of the machines. I don't, it's not clear to me that in a, in a world of even less deterministic systems that that's going to make, uh, maybe that makes PGAS easier because you can't count on uh, coordinated in message traffic anyway. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the story I'm hearing. So, so there's another problem, and that is that these codes aren't going to, they don't run on one system. They have to run on all of the systems that we have, right? And so, um, you know, whether whoever sells it to you. So, so they have to come up with a, pro it's even harder than what you said, they have to come up with an efficient program model that not only runs on whatever, you know, big system we might have defined for you, but also, you know, other smaller clusters at different sites. And so if you do anything particularly unique, um, they're not, they're not going to port because they can't port to every system. So it has to be something that is probably not as efficient as they would like, but something that's portable. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why MPI is, is stuck around for so long, not necessarily because it's efficient, it's because it works everywhere. So there's a transition path between where we are today and even an extreme change that can maintain legacy. Trinity is supposed to be part of that. This, this next machine that we're talking about buying within our complex um, is supposed to support both legacy codes and offer the hardware and software that lets them move forward. So there's, there's a way to not make it intrusive this moment, but pretty much signal our intentions that things are changing. I, I think the code teams know that, well, as, as I pointed out, literally, they're trying to avoid it as best they can. Um, but Sequoia is a, is a challenge for them, and they're, they're having to figure things out. Um, it, and also, there are research efforts going on. The Department of Energy is funding other things because this is, this is a very big problem. And, um, and, you know, the world of applications here has, has to change in some way. And we don't know what it is, and that makes it even harder because the target is, is fuzzy. So, do you think... Trinity is going to fail in its role as a transition machine, that the users will just get on and go, well, I don't have to change my app, so I'm well, not going to... Well, if you buy something that you know, has a lot of memory per core and really good bandwidth and all that stuff, they're not going to change. They're waiting, they're uh, too waiting bad. for quantum. They're waiting for quantum. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I like to quantum. applaud the courage of the panelists for coming to the most heavily attended lug and recommending that, that luster is no longer needed in the future. <laughs> no, no, I did not actually say that. Well, it, yeah, was, it was you, Terry, actually, my that I'm... Bullet, I'm my last <laughs> bullet. My last bullet said it, use luster. And it didn't come from the PVS guy. It, it came from, from Lee, who said, you know, let's not have a file system interface on the NVRAM. Let's just do persistent memory. And then it came from you, Terry, who said, you know, we just need maybe a tape archive with maybe a little bit of disk at the front. So I, I have two questions. One is, is it the case that burst buffers can provide the agility that spindles previously provided, thereby rendering, you know, a system that goes straight from burst buffers to tape possible? And then the second question is, if that's the case, what is the linkage between Lee's persistent memory on, on the NVRAM and your tape archive, Terry? So there was so there's more to the story than what I what I talked to you about, right? Well, part of the story is if you can keep it on the compute platform all the time, right? You do your data analysis, you, you do it. You, you maybe you just don't send it off, right? You send off only what you need to archive. Right now, the I mean, this is a you know a ten year eight year prediction or something. Right now, people send off intermediate results to the to the file system. That's what it's used for. If you don't need to do that, and you can just send some, a much smaller set off to the archive, that may be uh, something that's doable in this time frame. Um, I do, they did ask us to predict whether Luster will be around in 10 years, and I, and I think the answer is yes. And I think it has other roles in, in centers, but, I, but it, particularly with the largest platforms, it may, not, it may not be. But there's more traditional systems that we buy. We don't buy, um, you know, these kind of systems that push the envelope. Well, we're going to be buying, you know, servers and so on, and, and clusters of servers, and I think Luster's got a, a role there. 
it's an interesting thought experiment that that we've had uh, you know in groups like ours here where even as I was pointing out on my slide, you know, we're thinking of, you know, a storage system in the 2020 time frame of, you know, 120 petabytes. And that's a huge, you know, disk farm that holds data. Okay, but what if you, you know, imagine that there's 120 petabytes in your compute partition. I mean, do you need disks out there then? I mean, you've got as much space in your computer as all the files you're ever storing out there. So could you just use that as your file system? That's kind of what Terry's saying as well. And there's just a tape system out there for you know, long-term storage kind of stuff. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's sort of a wild thought. But it's, it's not technically infeasible given the, you know, the predict, projected you know, increase in capacity of uh, non-volatile memory in the future. Yes? Or, or, okay. You're in it. So I would like to pick up on the be courageous and say there's no Luster file system. And there was a question in the air about the programming model, but it didn't address one of the, the issues that we discussed before. So yes, we're going to have one petabyte of memory in each of uh, every one of the compute nodes. Does the ratio make any sense anymore? Unless we change the... So if you change the programming model so you can take advantage of one petabyte on each compute node, which would be cheap enough, let's say, much cheaper than memory, but slower. Than, uh, than DRAM, then there should be a change in the software, right? I mean, that's my so thing. Do you think that will work out of the box without changing the application? So oh. you're, a you're asking if the applications are going to be changing and so we don't need to have the same ratios? Is that what you're asking? That's what I'm saying, yeah. Okay. Maybe the ratio is, was good for DRAM, but... Yeah. The ratio is, is, is independent of, of the architecture. The ratio is dependent on the... Um, the kinds of algorithms and the kind of data that's needed to solve the problem. So you can only break up these, these codes in such a way that you can get for uh, a bit of work, you need to have so much data. Some things have, have 10,000 variables for each little partition of the data that you, you spread across your system. And, and so I'm not going to say that it can't change, but I'm going to say it needs to have people that rethink the algorithm and the problem, I think, from the ground up. Instead of being, um, um, you know, kind of parsimonious on computing, which is what these codes grew up in that world, it's kind of reversing it and saying computing is free. Whenever you can recompute something, whenever you can, you know, compute and hide the fact that you can't, there's latency with the memory, you should do it. But the way the algorithms are constructed for a lot of these um, applications is the other way. And it's going to take some, I think, some, you know, a research project with a lot of mathematicians and, um, and other people to figure out if we can take these algorithms and solve the same problems with completely different algorithms that are more tuned to these kinds of um, um, systems. And that's what's making this so darn hard. <coughs> Yeah. Let's say three X. Still you can change something because you know what you say I need two gigabytes per core to do this work. Maybe you can get ten gigabytes a little slower and do a Yes. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And we need the, um, th that's very true, and we're looking at that. But you need to have the, the software to make this all work. And that doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, but you're I mean, right. There, there is um, there is precedence for for these types of algorithmic changes. I mean, there's there's been this work in sort of these communication avoiding algorithms and so forth. And so the applied mathematics community does develop new methods to help us adapt to changing conditions. And that's part of why we can deal with some of the machines that have these lower network bandwidth and latency um, properties than, than we than we would have liked in the past. Um, and so I could. I could imagine that somebody would say, oh, well, I have a whole bunch of space for um, saving up intermediate results. I can have these ridiculously large ghost zones now that I couldn't have before. But it, we, that, like you said, that community's got to get engaged. And, and also, also, like you said, it can't be a one-off machine or, or you're not going to get that community paying a, enough attention to, to make a, a real difference there. Okay. Let's get this question over here. You've been very patient waiting. <laughs> oh, that's all right. It's, it's a little off topic, so I don't know about bringing it up. But, you know, I've heard tape mentioned a couple times. And as these machines get four or five petabytes of MV RAM or anything else that you want to stick in there and you want to move that off and recall it someday, 
I can see maybe you get it to tape, but I don't see you ever getting it back in a reasonable amount of time or that we could afford enough tape drives to even do it. So the disk cache in front of the tape drives will be there, but that's going to fill up and so you're going to have to find some way to expand it or something to do with it because I just don't see us putting a, a three petabyte object or millions of objects that you have to have to restart your job out on tape and getting it back in a reasonable amount of time. In my world, it never leaves the machine. What happens when you retire the machine and you got to bring it in for the ATS-3? The, the app certainly gets to write its output, all right? It just keeps running, you know? And, and its output should be a significant subset of what it's doing. Right now, our apps do things like uh, write a checkpoint, write a checkpoint, write a checkpoint. Well, that checkpoint's really the output. And I think it's um, symptomatic of what Terry was saying. They're being a little bit lazy. They don't, they don't need all that. Yeah, but then we have different apps and different users, and your queue time is up, and all this, you're going to change the policy of the way we use the machine, I'm assuming. Well, the, the, the machine will have the capability of moving the entire content. You will pay. You will wait. Terry's right. If you don't need to store it, don't. I think um, <coughs> Al hit on, hit on the sensors and experimental data and observational data points. And those, those communities generate quite a bit of data, and their sensors are getting much better. And so they're generating data at these tremendously larger rates. And um, we have to have a solution for where to put that stuff. We're, at, at, at last I checked, a, later there was a presidential mandate for us to figure out how to store this stuff, right? So, um, whatever, the, whatever the cheapest. How's that going, by the way? Is that going good? It's not part of my job, th thankfully. Oh. Um, but, yeah, but I mean, but seriously, that's part of the problem is every, uh, nobody wants to take uh, ownership of this archiving problem because it seems a little bit ridiculous. Um, but, you know, whatever the cheapest media per byte is, is going to play a role in that until, you know, forever um, and it sounds to me like that's going to be a component of maybe not exascale systems maybe exascale systems but certainly um, a number of the lab activities are going to have a, a big emphasis on how to hold on to this stuff over the long term we're already trying to deal with that on Trinity yeah. yeah okay so uh, we're like over time uh, we're going to have one more question from Alex uh, and then we'll call it. All right. Speaking about tapes, uh, unfortunately, data when they produced, they can be produced in different different order than consumed. Suppose we have metrics and produce column for well, many days, and then when we consume data for processing, it's in different order, and the same for sensors. So, speaking about production farms for data. It may be uh, we will need then some I.O. farm to do I.O. jobs to take data, reorder, and this is different aspect. So probably it was considered. Okay, so I think, I think the, the observation was about um, reorganization of data from its yes. original form. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think um, actually that's one thing that if we have a good idea of what the data is going to be used for, Many of these different ways that NVRAM fits into the system give us opportunities to get that right on the way off the system um, if we do have to store it. And that's one thing that is actually one of the easier things, I think, to do, honestly. <laughs> you always have the opportunity to reorganize, da reorganize data when you move it. Yeah. If it's going to move anyway, you're already paying a really significant yeah. price. It's a mortal sin. The, the tricky analyses that, that folks are trying to figure out how to do on these uh, on these systems without storing stuff for post-processing is the temporal stuff and uh, that's that's the piece where the analysis community is having the most trouble so I want to track a particle through a simulation and I'm going to figure out what the interesting particle is at the end because that's where some interesting phenomenon happened and now I want to know where that came from and that implies a, a fairly large data set and uh, and it may not be obvious from the start um, where the interesting regions were, right? And 
so anyway, so the analysis community's got their own set of problems that are uh, implied by this. You may not always know uh, your data. So uh, suppose that you do a picture of some object every day, and you do not know the object of your interest. And uh, after two years, you would like to, you, you point some hint and tell, okay, I would like to have history for last two years. And this is the data re rearrangement, right? Right, you're right. There's some cases where you don't know. And another good case is when some entirely different community comes in and wants to start using some data set for a different purpose than it was originally intended. And then, okay, oops, you know, uh, our bad. An Hopefully we store what we needed. Is the one that we heard earlier, the luster log files, right? You get the error and now you want to trace it back to root cause, but it means that you have to have kept all of that data. You, you don't want to get to throw it away. Um, We're getting shut down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Al Geist, Rob Ross, uh, Lee Ward, uh, Terry Quinn, you know, let's give them a big round of applause.